Starge. This is a wonderful turnout on a Wednesday night of the 1st of June, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. This is a, this is a matter of great concern to me, and I guess it is to you too, and that's wonderful. My name is Susan DeCastro. I represent Ward 4 on the Brockton City Council. At this time, let me quickly thank our audiovisual genius, uh, Madam Montero, who is, who is recording this meeting, and she'll make sure that it's shown plenty of times on our cable access channel. I'd also, at this time, like to introduce the um, elected officials who are here, and I'm grateful for their presence. State Representative Michelle Dubois is here, and, and she will speak later on in the program. Counselor at Large Moses Rodriguez is here, and he is also a Ward 4 resident, so this, these concerns are close to his heart. Um, so this is the first Ward 4 meeting of 2022, and I had planned to have one in the first quarter of the year, and the COVID numbers were too high, and I didn't think it was a good idea to meet. So initially, when I planned this meeting at the end of April, it, the theme was supposed to be three things that the different departments of the city do to help Brockton residents. And I had one of the deputy fire chiefs coming to talk about code enforcement, which is stepping up. Um, I also had, um, who else? John Messia, who is an amazing person. He works in the mayor's office. He's the head of constituent services and community engagement. And he was going to come and talk about all of the city's efforts to get people vaccinated against COVID-19. And that's quite a story in itself, a success story. Um, but then on May 12th, I found out about this matter in a Zoom meeting, and I was sick as a dog with COVID, but I hung on to listen to all of this, and we decided during the meeting that this, this, the theme of this, this Ward 4 meeting had to change to exploring the proposal that is in front of the City Council, as well as talking about the wastewater treatment plant, which has been in our lives since all of us moved to Ward 4, and, and those of you from, the, from throughout the city as well, it's a factor. Now, since I announced this meeting and, and this topic, um, uh, there's, been, there's been good developments. Last Friday, Mayor Sullivan had a meeting at which I was at, the, the Chief Financial Officer was at, the DPW Commissioner, State Rep Dubois, and a few others. And the mayor said that based on what he knows, he does, we don't know enough. And so he directed us to put a pause on this order that's in front of the council. He asked me specifically to table it, which I will be doing at our June 9th meeting. So why are we still here? Well, we're still here. These are temporary stops. And as I wrote to everyone, or a lot of you yesterday, all it takes is a vote of the council to take a matter off the table and bring it forward and ultimately vote on its merits. And so we need to talk about the wastewater treatment plant. We need to talk about what happens to our sludge. The, uh, the fecal matter that gets pulled out of the, the, the liquids that come in through the pipe from all our houses, What's happening, what happened for many years is it went into an incinerator and the city burned it, okay? And those of you who have lived in Ward 4 for a while know what I'm talking about when I say the air would have such a stench to it. There were so many nights when my children were babies that I had to run around on a hot summer day and close all the windows because the air was just awful, so not palatable to breathe. Um, we stopped incinerating about five years ago for several reasons, including the incinerator was out of date. Since then, we've been taking the sludge, and we have a contract to truck it to Naugatuck, Connecticut, where it gets incinerated. And this is happening all over New England. There are a few incinerators that are open. They're considered regional incinerators, and they're taking everybody's sludge and incinerating it and having everything go up into the air. 
In 2022, we have to ask ourselves whether that is the right technology. And we also have to ask, what is better technology? What is out there? So on May 12th, it was explained to me that this order that I sponsored to borrow just about $35 million from the state was, the purpose of it was to add new sludge dryers to the wastewater treatment plant and also some additional technology that would gasify the sludge, would, would incinerate it at very high temps in a contained area so it would end up being like dust and that's called biochar. Now that's my home ec major in college explanation of what this is. But fortunately, there are several environmental engineers here. They consult for the city. They're with a company called CDM Smith, who are going to explain this probably in a more proper and scientific way than I did. But that's the net result. And, and this is happening quite a bit in Europe. It's happening to a limited extent in the United States. Of course, there are companies that hope that it will really catch on in the United States that think it's the answer, I'm not sure. But we have to find an answer for Brockton. We, we have to hear about this tonight and think about it. We also have to explore other alternatives. Rep Dubois has been doing just that, and that's why she'll speak toward the end of the program. So before I start, I just want to quickly um, share two things with you. I had a meeting today about the Grove Street Bridge. The State Department of Transportation um, inspects all of the bridges in the Commonwealth once a year. And when they came down in 2019, they found a crack in the Grove Street Bridge. And of course, Grove Street is a large street. It connects Main Street with Summer Street. And, you know, on the east side, if you will. So it's a big deal. So they put limitations on the use of that bridge until it can be replaced. And in the meeting that I was in today, it's a real arduous, expensive, and, and years and years long process to get that bridge replaced. And so Rep. Dubois and I did our best to see if we could get them to put the pedal to it. and get it done sooner. It looks like right now, by the time the design work is done and the bidding is done and everything is lined up, it won't be replaced until the winter or spring of 2025. That's a long time, yeah. Especially because they've known about it since 2019. That said, I want to make all of you aware, as well as everyone at home who watches this video, the bridge is posted for, uh, for the following limitations. Two axle truck, 18 tons. Three axle trucks, 25 tons. Five axle trucks, 36 tons. The way this came to light, we, the reason we had this meeting today is someone contacted State Senator Brady, who was actually also in the meeting, to say that her bus stop had changed because the back buses are no longer running over the Grove Street Bridge because of the weight limitation. So we got to talking about it. If you're aware of trucks that are that large that are using the bridge, maybe they should rethink that. I don't think we want trucks that heavy going over it. So I put that out to you. And the other thing I wanted to share is I had a message from Mayor Sullivan. He asked me to remind all of you he had conflicting events tonight. And these events go back most of the year. He has events that involve Brockton High School as well as its band's boosters. And so he can't be here tonight and he's, he's sorry. He sends his best wishes. He wants me to repeat to all of you that as a mayor, he will never support an incinerator at the wastewater treatment plant. He thought that maybe he was misquoted in the, in the Brockton Enterprise. There was an article about this within the last week. He wants me to make sure that you know he would never support that. And so without, yes, that's very good. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Patrick Hill. He is our DPW commissioner. Good evening, everybody. So I'm here to talk about 
the future uh, of our wastewater treatment facility sludge hall. Um, this has been going on since 2018 when we shut our incinerator down and currently we haul 14 trucks a week out of the sewer plant. Those trucks travel from here to Nogatuck, Connecticut, as the council uh, alluded to. Um, and, and, and those costs keep escalating. So we were instructed to try to find a solution. Now, this, this solution we've been looking at for several years. Um, at one point, there was a regional facility that was going to be set up in New Bedford. Um, that went on for about a year, and uh, the, I believe the voters in New Bedford voted that down. So that regional facility was never built. After that, there was another regional facility that was proposed in Falmouth to do the same thing. That has yet to take, uh, take ground, and it's not supported, I don't think, by the people of Falmouth. So that leaves us with sludge and 14 trucks a day in and out of the city. Um, so we started exploring technologies. We put an application into the state revolving fund. We were granted a $35 million project through the SRF program to look and try to come up with a solution to manage a sludge here in Brockton. Right now, where we stand is we've officially withdrawn our SRF um, appropriation for this, for this coming year. We do plan on applying next year. Um, and we're in, in kind of in a planning phase. So we've started exploring other technologies because the cost of hauling sludge is escalating at an uncontrollable rate. Next year, um, last year it was $2 million in, in the sewer budget. Next year it's going to be $2.5 million in the budget. We see those costs escalating 10 to 12% a year. So it's going to be an uncontrollable thing to sustain with a budget the way it exists. So we started exploring technologies. The best technologies that we could find, and we have done nothing more than research at this point, would be to install a sludge dryer. And I have a couple of uh, engineers here from CDM Smith to explain the process. I'm not really a technical person. Um, they can explain how the sludge dryer works. That sludge dryer will reduce the sludge as it stands. So the sludge currently is 26% solids. That sludge dryer will reduce the solids to 90%. After the sludge drying process, we started looking at other technologies. What can we do with the sludge? So either we can haul that sludge out, or we could do a secondary process, which would knock our truck traffic down to one truck a week. So we go from 14 to one truck a week. So we're still exploring these technologies. Um, <coughs> just to be clear, the, the, the technology that we're really looking hard at right now is called pyrolysis. Um, the pyrolysis process, uh, one of the engineers can explain how that works. It's not gasification. It's a different process. Um, and, and that's where we stand. So. Yes, ma'am. How many towns other than Brockton dump into Brockton? Um, how many? 14 trucks that we have going out. How many other communities? How many other, how many other towns dump into Brockton? When you say dump in the collection system, you mean how many other towns do we accept sewage I'm from? Dump in the storage system. Storage. Yeah, storage. Yeah. Okay. So, so cur currently we accept sewer through intermunicipal agreements. Right. With, with yeah. it, with the town of Whitman, the town of Abington, and we have a couple of smaller ones. Which are? Uh, the RK Plaza. We just signed an agreement with the town of Avon. Um, we and just signed Stone a, Hill. Right, we have Stone Hill, too. Stone Hill. We have quite a few other towns other than our own who are also trucking out of those, uh, those 14 trucks, truck loads that are starting in weekly. How many of those? So we, tr we treat just shy of 17 million gallons a day of fuel. Probably 2 million gallons of that is from other communities. And are they also looking at alternatives, or are we still going to let them piggyback on us? 
So they, they will be part of the process. So this process, the, the sewer is still going to go through its regular process. And, and this is, you know, on the, on the tail end of that. So yes, it, there's no intention of, I guess, shutting them off. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, I want to know if we can cut them loose. Or are you going to charge them more? Because again, everybody seems to be dumping everything into rock. I don't know, have a spine or a backbone or something. Because it appears that we don't have that here. And we just keep saying yes. We just keep bending over. And you know what's happening? We're losing our children out of here. They're moving. I raised four children in this town, in this city. I was raised in this city. Mine couldn't wait to get out for reasons like this. So that bothers me. So I just need that to be said. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lander has made very good points, but that said, I would love it if you'd indulge me and wait until the end to make your comments and ask your questions, because we have a lot of technical information that, want, that we want to present to you, so you'll have even more questions at the end. I, I hope that's all right. So at this time, before I introduce our two environmental engineers, I want to acknowledge and thank Councilor at Large Rita Mendez, Ward 2 Councilor Maria Tavares, and Ward 6 Councilor, who's also the Council President, Jack Lally. They're here tonight and they're really concerned about all of this. In fact, I must say, the night that this matter came in front of the, the Finance Committee on May 16th, I was still out sick. And a number of my, all of the counselors here tonight chipped in and asked very good questions and made very concerned uh, comments about this. I, I feel like we are, the Ward 4 are really supported on this matter by the City Council, and I want you all to know that. So at this time, I would like to introduce two environmental engineers who work for CDM Smith, the consultants for the city, Chad Kershaw, and Eric Spargamino. Gentlemen. So thank you for having me, everybody. Eric Spargamino uh, from CDM Smith. Um, I'm an environmental engineer, so I, 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 my specialty is wastewater and biosolids and contaminants like PFAS. So happy to answer any questions. Um, but just to, to start from the top, um, the city, like, like Patrick and the counselor explained, that the city accepts liquid wastewater from, um, from within the city and in a couple surrounding communities. That wastewater gets treated at the facility here, um, and the facility uses biology, so it uses bacteria to degrade all the waste that comes into the facility. And then through a number of other processes, the, the, all the wastewater is disinfected before it gets discharged to the river, and the city usually exceeds its permit limits, so you should be very proud that the, that the treatment plant on the, on the liquid side of things does a very good job treating that water. Um, what happens there is the leftover from that treatment process are those dead bacterial cells, and that's what makes up the sludge. So it's not fecal matter in those trucks that are driving through the city, that's actually the endogenous or, or dead bacterial cells that used to go to the incinerator and that, that were incinerated um, and fortunately for the city, that, that incinerator no longer exists. It is a little bit of an eyesore, or a major eyesore. Um, and there are other communities like Connecticut and Rhode Island that have some, some much larger incinerators that, fortunately for us, take our sludge currently. The long-term problem with that is, is those communities don't enjoy having those incinerators either. And those incinerators, like Brockton's, are towards the end of their useful life, and they are getting to the point where they have to make decisions about shutting down or implementing a new technology. So the, the city of Brockton is being proactive and starting to look at this before those incinerators shut down. Because as, as Pat explained, we were at a, about a million dollars per year in cost when the incinerator was running to dispose of that sludge. Now we're at a little over $2 million a year shipping it to Connecticut as 
things get worse in the sludge disposal market, um, those costs are projected to increase pretty substantially. Um, we've I've been working with a, a lot of other communities in New England, and we've seen an average increase over the last two years of 72 percent. Um, and especially as things like PFAS that many of you heard of um, becomes on the horizon, um, it's the disposal market is getting much, much more difficult to, to dispose of sludge cost effectively, so those costs are just going to keep going up and up and up. Um, so it's, it, it is a wise time to start thinking, why we're here today, to start thinking about new technologies that can, um, that can manage our sludge much more sustainably and much more environmentally friendly than shipping out 14 trucks a week to Connecticut or trying to find another home. Um, you know, folks like Boston, they, they put it on rail cars and trucks that go all over the country. Um, we want to be able to have our own sustainable solution so we're not reliant on or, or financially bound by others um, and any way to reduce that truck traffic through the city too. Um, so a little bit about some of the technologies that, that Patrick mentioned. Um, so right now the sludge is dewatered on site to um, it's 26% solids, which which all that means is it's the percentage of or the concentration of uh, that dead bacterial cell that is, is in those trucks that you see driving through town. Um, what that looks like, it, it looks like a wet dirt. So you could pick it up in your hand. You could, you could I wouldn't say you'd make a snowball out of it, but it's, it looks like a wet dirt. Um, if you were to dry it um, through, through a drying technology that I'll explain, um, you can get that to like 80 or 90% solids, which, which um, could look more like Cheetos, um, or I, I say goose poop, but it, but it, um, and then, or even granules actually. So if anybody knows quicklime and spraying on your lawn, usually that's white, but if you pick that, if, if you um, picture that as brown, it looks kind of like that, at least like what MWRA, uh, Deer Island in Boston produces. Um, so how you get there is, there's a number of technologies, and, and we're, they're all on the table for us, but, um, one technology that we spent a lot of time looking at is called a, a belt dryer, or a sludge dryer. It basically looks like Domino's Pizza oven, but much bigger. It's a it's a conveyor belt that moves really, really slow through a through an oven that operates between 200 and 400 degrees Fahrenheit, just like our ovens at home, um, and it just evaporates all the all the water off that solid to get it down to that 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 quick line or that that Cheeto that I'm describing. Um, and that will cut your truck traffic down to about half of what it is now. And that material could actually um, be beneficially used somewhere else. So if, if local farmers or if local residents wanted to use that as a, as a product to fertilize their lawn, I, I've done it on my lawn, uh, there's very strict EPA requirements that have to be met to, to, to use material like that, where all the pathogens are killed, there's no heavy metals, uh, things like that. Um, so that's one option is you would, you would treat it to that what's called class A biosolid as defined by EPA part 503. Uh, or you could take it a step further, which is the pyrolysis process that, that Patrick mentioned. Um, that actually gets it to this, this char stage, which looks like carbon. Um, it, that actually reduces your, your mass down about 90%. So like Patrick said, that would turn 14 trucks a week down to one or two. Um, and that material could similarly be used as a fertilizer or concrete, concrete aggregates, things like that. It's, 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 um, it's, I don't want to say it's inert, but it's, it's about as close to inert as possible. Um, and, and all that, there's, there's, there's very strict environmental regulations with, from DEP and EPA that would be met with any of these process, any of these processes, and are, a, and are a tremendous factor with when it comes to selecting any of these processes, because not only do we want to make sure that whatever happens at the plant is equal to, or we don't want to make it worse than incineration, but we also want to make sure it's better. And the current environmental regulations with, especially emissions, um, are very strict. So these processes are looked at with a very fine magnifying glass of making sure that anything that goes into the environment um, is sustainable and does not hurt the public around it. So. Um, I think that's all the technical talking points I have. I'm happy to take questions if you'd like me to, or talk about anything else. Sure, sure. 
Um, I, I will say, because I know it's, it's very hot right now in, in Taunton, um, they are proposing a gasification process that is, um, it's, it's also a higher temperature process that treats sludge and, and brings it down to a char stage, but, but it's, um, it's not pyrolysis. It's a, different, it's a different process. Pyrolysis operates at different temperatures with a lack of oxygen and thereby um, the, all of the ins and outs or the mass balance and air balance around it are very different than what you would see with gasification. So I guess when you, when you hear about it in the news and when you hear about it with our neighbors in Taunton, um, just remember that it is a different process. So, but, but yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate everyone having me. Thank you. I'm told we're going to wait for questions, but happy to answer any and all questions later. So we'll just hold your questions a few more minutes now. So um, our chief financial officer is here tonight, and he would like to talk money with you and talk finances and about the uh, great deal, and it is a good deal, that the, that the state is offering right now to finance uh, infrastructure water projects, including things like this. So this is uh, Mr. Troy Clarkson, our CFO. Thank you, Councilor, very much. I'm very pleased to be here, particularly in this ward. Um, just indulge me for a minute. Uh, those of you of a certain age may remember 50, 40 years ago, the last house on Plain Street before we went into East Bridgewater uh, was a big black house with a porch on it. And the fella that owned it used to sell strawberries out in the front yard. Does anyone remember that? So that fellow was my grandfather, Guido Marincelli. Uh, so my mom grew up a mile from here. And I spent, uh, my uncle Amy, Guido's brother, some of you may remember him, actually had a house right across from the Davis School here. And he sold fruit as well. Uh, so, and I tell you that at the beginning so that you understand, working here in Brockton isn't just... Uh, a job for me. When this opportunity came up a few years ago for me to come work here, it was like coming home. Uh, I spent a lot of time here. My grandparents moved to the Cape where I lived uh, many years ago and they both passed, but, uh, but my roots are here. My dad grew up on Ash Street and uh, uh, to be able to be part of this community on a daily basis is very meaningful to me. So I take the work that I do as the steward of your public dollars very seriously. Uh, and so my role in this project and others is to really be the watchdog of your finances. And so I will repeat uh, what Councilman Castro said at the beginning of this evening's meeting because the, the message from the mayor was very clear. Uh, and, and so he is firm that we are at the beginning, not the end, of the stage of trying to figure out how to fix this problem. But this meeting is not a one-off. I have left my business cards on the table and I encourage all of you to, to reach out and to share your thoughts. Uh, Pre-COVID, I know the ward meetings are something that happened with some frequency and I'm happy to come back anytime or meet with you Individually, I see some folks in the room who have been in my office where we've talked about the city's finances and how we spend your tax dollars. So as it relates to this project, I think I'll just very briefly go over. We, we have a packet, and I encourage you to look at that. It's important to understand the numbers in there are hypothetical because a final solution has not yet been determined. But if we borrow roughly $35 million for some sort of process to deal with the sludge, uh, then that on its face, as crazy as it sounds, to borrow $35 million would wind up actually saving us money because of the annual costs to get rid of the sludge. So that just shows you how costly it is to get rid of that sludge every year. Now, the Commonwealth is offering principal forgiveness through when Pat said SRF, that's the State Revolving Fund, and that's a program through the Department of Environmental Protection 
where they not only offer a very competitive interest rate of 1.5%, but they offer principal forgiveness. At least 9%, but now with the influx of all those federal dollars, we're certain that it could be 14.7, but maybe as high as 49%. So that gives us some urgency in moving forward while those federal dollars are available to come up with a long-term solution to the sludge. So really just to begin the conversation, I've shared with you some spreadsheets that show if the state gave us no principal forgiveness, in year one, the savings would still be several hundred thousand dollars a year. But if the state kicks in some money, the savings grow into the millions of dollars. And that's important because the additional cost, uh, the sewer operation is paid for under what's called an enterprise fund. So that money is kept separate from the general fund of the city. So all of the costs to run the sewer plant in the sewer department are paid for by all of you through your sewer rates. Uh, so by keeping those costs down, it relieves pressure to increase the rates. And so, and we take that very seriously, and I know Councilor McCastro and the other councilors that are here are not interested uh, in raising your rates on a regular basis because they understand the impact that that has on your lives. So it's our job, as the staff support, to provide ways to save money to reduce that pressure on the rates. So, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end you might have on the specific finances, uh, but I wanted to frame for you why we think it's important to move forward with something, uh, because the opportunities for principal forgiveness, there hasn't been this kind of federal money available in my career, and I've been working in public life for 30 years. Uh, so there is some urgency for us to move forward to try to develop a solution. But I know I speak for the mayor when I say that that solution will be collaborative with input from the community. Thank you. And lastly, on our lineup is State Representative Michelle Dubois. Thank you, Susan. Thank, and so I feel really comfortable in this room. I was a city councilor in Brockton for 10 years in Ward 6. And then I've been your state representative for the last eight years. And I got into politics by helping all of you and working with all of you as allies, uh, maybe not all of you, but a lot of you, to hold off the um, diesel backup natural gas power plant that they wanted to put down by the, um, the wastewater treatment plant. So I'm here to say thank you to Councilor Nicastro for bringing this to my attention. Sometimes when I'm up at the state house, I don't catch everything that's happening at the city level, but she reached out to me as it went far well to tell me about what was happening and to introduce myself. Um, my name is Michelle Dubois and um, I'm your state representative. And what got me into public service was environmental justice. I grew up with asthma, I grew up around people that um, had some serious health impediments that now we know a lot is linked to our environment and how they dump in communities of color and low income communities because um, they can, because it's an easier way for them to go. So when this got brought to my attention, up at the State House, I call myself the wastewater girl. I love garbage and I like wastewater and I like sludge. This is what I tell people, my colleagues up at the State House, this is something I care about. And they also know that I care about environmental justice. So for the last eight years as your state representative, I've been working with every single environmental group across the state and public health organization across the state to get them to endorse uh, an environmental justice bill that will protect communities like ours, low-income communities of color with high uh, non-English attainment levels of our population and the folks that live here, to help us to get information about these types of toxins and to protect us in ways that we can access the permitting process and put a halt to these things. And it's been an eight-year fight, and with a whole state, it became the number one priority for almost every single environmental, environmental group and public health group across the state by last year. And the Speaker of the House picked up my bill as his very first act in March of 2021, passed it into law, and now we have an environmental justice protection law in Massachusetts. And the reason I tell you this is because what's being proposed here, this paralysis. How do I say it? 
pyrolysis, okay? When you do the research, look it up. You always see it's like incinerator, comma, gasification, comma, paralysis. The temperatures get to 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit, I've been told. I've spoken with Conservation Law Foundation. They weren't able to come tonight, but on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to meet her and Susan DeCastro at Cable Access at 12 noon, and she's going to talk about what this process of our sludge does and can do to our public health and our air and our oxygen. And um, I'm against this, 100% against this. I will fight it at the State House. I will ask the DEP commissioner not to fund it. I will not, I do not want the any type of incineration down in Ward 4. My conversation, thank you, right. The budget is $493 million dollars, right, around last year, the city budget. Um, $2.5 million is what they say um, we'll save. But really, if I understood it right, it would, because we're already spending a million, it would be $1.5 million we'd save every year. And on a budget, $1.5 million on a $493 million budget, that's 0.3% of our budget. I think that we can spend 0.3% of our budget to utilize our collective in intellect, because we got it. I mean, we got a really good team that can look into the broader um, ways that we can get rid of our sludge. Maybe we send it to a sludge-only landfill. Whatever we do, I was very um, heartened to hear the mayor today on a Zoom say he will never approve an incinerator in Ward 4 because a lot of this comes from the mayor, what he's willing to do with the city council because the city council has stood up and put a hold on this to learn more about the whole process and what um, I, to be honest with you, and Senator Brady and the whole Brockton delegation can do at the State House to make sure that if for some reason this proposal gets up to the State House, we do what's right by the residents and try our darndest with no stopping to stop the proposal. Because we, um, one of the proudest moments as a public servant I've ever had was when I got the call that we were closing the Ward 4 incinerator. That was the, one of the, that is something that like, when I put on my resume, it will be getting the environmental justice bill passed and closing the incinerator because that is what environmental justice is. It's our public health. So on Wednesday, Susan, myself, and attorney Christy Pesci, Kirsty Pesci from Conservation Law Foundation, are going to take a public access. If some other people would like to come, and they're welcome to come and be in the audience. But she's going to explain it all. And then we're going to kick off a series of educational meetings like this that I'm hoping that we can all get together on and um, collectively find a time that we can have more meetings about this. Because what we need to do is we need to drive this discussion. Up until now, we haven't been driving it. it it's been some kind of like, I, I'm going to call it, every person in here is a wonderful person, so none of this is personal, but it's like an evil, evil agenda in my opinion. To, to bring incineration from down south up here. The only place that this technology is currently operating, I've been told, is Redwood City, California. I'm all set with any type of greenwashing technology. Greenwashing is when they put out, and everybody believes it, like nobody believed PFAS existed. And now we know it does. So they put out this greenwashing and they say that, you know, somehow 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit is going to poof, kill PFAS. The thing, the real truth of the matter is, MEPA doesn't even have the test to be able to test what is coming out of this paralysis technology, this um, gasification incineration, high heat technology. They don't have the technology to test it, but what the environmental attorneys I'm talking to say is most likely it, it just gets broken down into super, 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 super aerosol particles that then we all breathe in, and five years from now when the technology develops to find out what's in it, then we all realize that we've been had. And so I'm here, and this is, like, this is like the reason I am in public service, is this type of public health thing. Because when you hear the industry telling you one thing, and they're well, well good, smart, informed people, you think, hmm, maybe that's true. 
But on this, when we're talking about incineration, and we have Conservation Law Foundation trying to fight it, um, this we have to stand firm together and say, uh-uh. There are other options, explore them. This is off the table. And so I'm just here to let you know I am with you, I'm fighting with you. You can find my telephone number. I am so against this. It's not worth the money. It's not worth your public health. It's not worth my asthma. Imagine if this was when, when COVID was at its highest. I sat back in such stress in my house because we were working from home like everybody. Literally playing this one Bible verse, just like trying to get through with everybody dying in Brockton. And I thought to myself, thank God that incinerator is closed. Because imagine the asthma and everything that people will be going through, and we layer this respiratory disease on top of them. So um, this is some moralistic stuff for me, and we need to fight this. And I think that the mayor has put the kibosh on this plan for incineration, but I, I just, and I thank Mayor Sullivan for that, because he's wonderful um, for seeing this for what it is. But we need to stay together, and that's my, um, that's my commentary. I will stay up here, and I am, I am your state rep. Call me anytime, 774-274. One three four four seven seven four two seven four one three four four. And please sign in. Susan has a sign in, and then we can keep you informed on what's going on. How's that? Okay. And then once we get this 
if we get this uh, plant in, how many more towns are we going to allow into Brockton with this sewer? Hey, we can right next door, let's just go up in Brockton. Um, so, those are concerns. I would never vote for this. You know, you know, I really look at problems. Every town has problems. You know, with, with the environment, with the sewerage, with the water, the whole, the whole thing. Um, but, yeah, everything lands here. So, I'd like to hear answers to the heavy metals and why we can't connect to the MWR. Thank you. Can I start with the answer before the professionals go? My answer to the heavy metals is we know because there was an article in The Guardian um, just on March 22nd, you can look it up, that talks about in, um, in a European country where the, um, the stuff that the end product that they use in fertilizer is now transferring heavy metals and PFAS. And the industry is saying that it just poof disappears sometimes, um, they're saying this, and reality that we're seeing where technology is catching up to the science is showing something different. And I am not an engineer, but this is what my research has shown, and I'm sure maybe the engineers can talk to that a little bit more. Sure, so um, uh, two things, uh, heavy metals, um, absolutely a, a major concern. Um, the, the toxicology over the years and the studies that have been done on human health, heavy metals are significant. Um, fortunately, um, Brockton, as well as every other uh, wastewater treatment plant regulated under the, the National Pollution uh, Discharge Program um, is required to sample for heavy metals uh, for anything that's discharged into the river and in their sludge. Um, so, like in Brockton's case, they have to submit their heavy metal testing to the Naugatuck facility so that Naugatuck is aware before they incinerate it of, of those heavy metals that they're not polluting their own community. And if the heavy metals are high enough that, that Brockton's receiving from, from all of us in the community, Naugatuck can actually shut us down and say they won't take us anymore. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely a huge concern with, with any process being considered. Um, whether it's in the city or, or any other plant. Um, the second thing, uh, a PFAS. Um, uh, I, I agree, P PFAS, especially as the scientific community is gaining a understanding of it. Um, there have been studies and processes that have promised the world for what, what they can do with PFAS. And I don't want to get too technical, but, but to there's a... a Big difference between transformation of PFAS compounds to destruction of PFAS compounds. A lot of uh, technologies transform these compounds, and when I say transform, uh, PFAS as a family of chemicals. It's you know it's the waterproofing, it's the Scotch guard on your carpets, it's it's the fireproofing foam, it's it's the nonstick pans a lot of us use and enjoy, um, but that. What makes it unique is its carbon fluorine bond, and it's the strongest bond in chemistry. So it's the hardest bond to break in chemistry. So a lot of processes that have have promoted themselves as PFAS destroyers were actually just transforming those compounds to different PFAS compounds that some may have been less harmful, some may have been more harmful. There's last count, I think there's over 7,000 of these compounds, and we don't even have ways to test a lot of them. So what what we've been doing, um, when I say we, just the, the scientific community with PFAS, is we've, we've developed ways that we can measure the fluorine balance. So we want to see that instead of just perfluorooctanoic acid is no longer persistent, because it, maybe it transformed to something else. We want to see that that actual carbon fluorine bond is broken, because then we know that that compound no longer exists and didn't transform into anything harmful. So the basis for a lot of the research we're doing is to make sure that it, we're looking at technologies that have proof of that fluorine balance where they're breaking the carbon fluorine bond so that we are absolutely certain that um, we're not transforming to other compounds. Like, like you were saying, that compounds that could be harmful because we don't want to greenwash, as you said, we don't want to... Um, we don't want to look at technologies that may just be pushing it to another arena. We want to make sure that with certainty that those those bonds are broken. So, and that's, that's you know, the process is still ongoing. Because a lot of these technologies are, 
are, are either being researched, but there are technologies that have proven to break this, these bonds. A lot of them aren't appropriate for the scale of the Brockton treatment plant, treating millions of gallons a day, um, but, but that's why we're looking at it. So um, I've never looked at it for the city of Rockton, but generally when we get this far away from the authority and from Deer Island, it just becomes cost prohibitive to try and get um, get rights of way and, and, and actually trench a pipe from somewhere like Rockton this far away from Deer Island, all the way to Deer Island. Um, it's easements through multiple towns. It's, you know, unfortunately in New England, we're not a flat state. We have lots of granite. Um, so. In general, that's that's why towns this far out haven't connected in the past. Thank you. I'm just going to get one over here. Not a great speaker, but I'm Veronica Stevens. I live at 32 Green Place. Um, so notified me a while ago, so I was for a few days a week ago. Um, my concern is mostly environmental. What is it going to do to us? What is it going to do to our property values? Why are we allowing something to come in that's going to diminish our value? And we can't even get a business to stay in the south side. we got vacant buildings down there that can't be used because of the snap. I mean, the drive-in, from my understanding, left because of the smell. So anything that's going to create any odor, diminish the value of the property, I just think we need to find another solution. Bringing in all of the sewage from other vicinities. I didn't even know that. Right. Absolutely. I have no idea. Um, and there's no cost. I don't know what we're earning or contracting with these things, with these villages, towns, cities. It's not worth selling our own backyard. It's just not for me anyway. So we want to attract business to the area. We're not doing that with the sewage plant. We want to increase the value of our homes. We're not doing that with the sewage plant. And what kind of, what are we saying to the kids? You're right. I've got four kids. I've got a daughter with five grandchildren, well, my five grandchildren, and she just moved to West Bridgewater. Who's going to be left to man the whole, man the beast, you know? Run the city. We gotta find another way. We gotta find a way not to be taking care of everybody else's trash. Excuse me, my name is Godfrey Ziegler. My wife is Annabelle. We live on 64 East Hill Street. I just retired from Amber Garden after 35 years and five months. So, my executive director, I've been talking to Brockton with the Tri Town uh, Agreement, which they didn't sign up for, for water and also for sewage treatment. So, we don't have to dig a pipe from here to here. If we go through Braintree or Quincy, that's all the connecting down and the water says water to Randolph or whatever they need water. So there are so many different ways to connect this pipe if we have to, you know, link up and the water to get, take care of our sweat treatment. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. And now that you've heard from my better half, um, he's very, very Subtle, he's very quiet, but he is the honest man. I've been married to him for 37 years. 
and we've been living in Brockton for 32 years. And he just retired, as he said, but he was the executive, executive for the finance at NWRA. So he knows what he's saying. I'm here to talk about, because our, our focus is on ideas. So let's reopen the idea. I have just one idea and I have one request. My idea is that can we find out from our mayor how much is he willing to get from all these other towns that are dumping their sewage on us, because I'm saying dumping because I don't know how much they're contributing to the cost of those 14 trucks. That's an idea because we need to find out how, how the mayor can give us more money, because 2.5 million is not enough. And um, my request, I don't know if it'll happen, but let's bring MWRA, I'm not voting for them or, or soliciting for them, but let them see our sewage plan and give ideas. We did it before, we didn't go with it. If you don't want to use NWRA, then we're talking about cost because we have to bring other companies here. But if it's working for NWRA and their water is clean and their sewage is working, we need to do that for Brockton because I don't want to have to leave Brockton. And we, we can make the map. We're next to Easton. We're next to Avon. We're next to Randolph and Braintree and all these other towns. But Avon is bringing their sewage. Whitman is bringing their sewage. Yes, they're a small town, but Brockton deserves better. That's right. Yes. Great. Thank you. say that we can't go. So now we have our own plan. Now my heavy metals are high. So now what do we do with our with our sludge? We can't shut our own plant down, so then where does it go? So, great question. Um, so in the past when that's happened, um, we've been plants like Brockton, um, although I don't think this has ever happened in Brockton, but um, they've been forced to just find other alternatives. So right now, the city pays about $140 per wet ton to dispose of their sludge in Naugatuck. Um, the most recently I've heard of, a, of another town in Mass being turned away from Naugatuck, they were paying $389 a ton, um, and they had to go, it wasn't in Massachusetts or Connecticut or Rhode Island, it was another state far away, but, but they had to find a landfill willing to take their sludge. Okay, 
and then how long would that take for it to happen and what's going to happen to all the sludge that's going to be sitting there until we find somebody? Or are we just going to keep burning it and none of us are going to know any different and then all of that heavy metal is going to go in the air? So the incinerator in 2018, they removed the fuel source. It can never be turned on again. Okay. But, I, but, but what I'm saying is even if we go with this new one, so we have the new one, it's going to go to 1,700 degrees or whatever, um, but what happens to the sludge if our heavy metals are too high? So if it's too high to go through our own, mm -hmm. now we have to find some place. Now if it takes us a week to find some place, what's happening with a week's worth of our poop? Sure. So it's, it's not necessarily 1,700 degrees. Um, that's just one example of a process mm -hmm. we're looking at, um, but definitely by no means is that the final process. It's just one process we're looking at and evaluating. Um, but, but yeah, sim similar to the other scenario, if our heavy metals were too high to put through any process, we would have to find a landfill that was willing to take it off-site, and it could be it could be at substantial cost. The the, um, the town I'm thinking of um, was uh, uh, Westfield that they were the ones that happened to recently, and they had spent one hundred fifteen thousand dollars in one month, which was twenty five percent of their annual budget. Um, there was another town in New Hampshire recently that had really had PFAS concentrations, and they weren't able to land apply it, and they had to pay about fifteen hundred dollars a ton to put it in a cement kiln uh, down in Maryland. But the question that I asked you didn't answer. I want to know if, if we're sending out 14 trucks a week mm -hmm. to go drop it off there. You're talking that's 14 trucks. If it takes us a week to find some place that's going to take our heavy metal poop, what's going to happen to that heavy metal poop for a whole entire week? So it, it, would, it would stay within the plant until they found a home for it. And I mean, Patrick and, and the folks at you know DPW, the waste treatment plant, that's I mean, that is their job to find that solution as quickly as possible. And there's a really strong network of, of folks like us that know where to dispose of sludge. Um, we would find it really really fast. But but yes, it would stay it would stay within the gates on site. Um, and do we have containers for that much to hold a whole week's worth? Well, of it would sludge? stay within the tanks that it's in right now. Okay. Yeah. Then my second question, I don't know if we could answer this one, is the towns that are um, bringing their stuff into Brockton, are they testing their sludge to make sure there's not heavy metals in theirs also? Because they could be contaminating us. So that comes in as a liquid to the treatment plant. So it, I, I don't know what their testing requirements are, but um, it would be so dilute at that point that we wouldn't be able to distinguish between any town's waste wastewater and um, Brockton's once it was in that sludge state. Okay, so they have no way of testing their own. So technically, East Bridgewater could be contaminating all of our stuff. I don't even know if they're one of them, but just say. But they could be contaminating our sludge, and we don't have a clue that they're contaminating it. So now we, as Brockton, have to pay all of this extra money to ship it out someplace else, and we're not getting any cost from any of these other towns. So the... The, the town does have an a industrial pretreatment program, so any um, contributors to the system over a certain volume and, and cer certain characteristics, they are required to sample for things like that before they're allowed to discharge into the system. So and why they, don't we have all of them do it? Whether it's just a little bit that's coming in here or a lot, they should all be doing it. If we have to do it, and we're going to be the ones that have to take care of all of it if it's coming in, then each one of these towns or cities, they should be required to have to do it also. Um, perhaps, and, and, and honestly, I, I'm not aware of how that rate structure works with different towns. Um, so, I mean, I understand how it works with different towns, but us being the ones that are actually taking it in, we should require it. Because, like, again, they could be sending in their heavy metals. We don't know what is coming from their source. And it may be in place. I, I just don't know the answer. I apologize. Okay. And th my last question. So, if we do burn it or whatever here, then it's particles. What happens to all of those particles? Where do we get rid of those? Like the burned stuff that looks like dust? So in in no scenario are we incinerating. So there's there's no there's no oxygen, there's no fuel, there's there's no there's no burning per se. Um, even the part the the process that I described, pyrolysis, it's a it's it's an oxygen free environment, so there's no flame. Um, okay, it, it, but it still goes down to some substance. It, it goes down to a char, it's called biochar, okay. and it looks it looks like, um, like if you've ever cut open a Brita filter at your house, um, or I do things like this because I'm an engineer. But, um, yeah, it looks like charcoal. It, it looks just like charcoal. Um, it's 
there's there's almost no dust. Um, it's because you're right. Incineration. There's ash, which is very dust dusty. Um, but biochar um, for this this particular process. There's yeah. Patrick will show you. There's a sample of it. Um, but it's a very low dust product. So then we get this back. that would go out any type of exhaust stack and into the air. Um, it usually requires things like um, um, modeling plumes to see where, where is it going. Um, really good understanding, like I said, of just of, of what's in it so that we know that it meets very strict environmental regulations. Um, and I'm So that's the first option you might want to look at. Now you're talking, yeah, I, I am in, in total agreement about incineration. I mean, there's a heat source. So if you're using incineration, I assume the heat source would be a natural gas fossil fuel supply. Well, just talk to me about burning fossil fuels, right? I don't want to talk about the dust, but you have combustion CO2 emissions and a giant oven. We're not talking about a little pizza thing. We're talking about a large stack. So the, the, the country is trying to get away from that, in that pollution. So I don't even talk about the, the, 
byproducts of burning sludge. I'm talking about the CO2 emissions that we don't want. When you mention Belmont and Fall River, there's a reason that they didn't permit it. You get a permit for something like this in Brockton, like you said, the one in Connecticut has been there for decades. Once you get a permit, and you do get an air quality permit, you're locked in to this for a long time. So Brockton residents, the kids that are going to this school, their children will be affected by whatever comes out of that. And the science today will be different than 10 years from now. We, every decade, we learn more and more about the environment and how it impacts us. The city of Brockton was an experiment 15 years ago when they did a capping of the landfill. The De Department of Environmental Protection came to this town, sat at this school, and told us, we're going to cap a landfill to protect your health. What they did was created a hydrogen sulfide factory. It actually replicated what that train did. Sulfur dioxide poisoned the residents of Brockton over a decade. And the Department of Environmental Protection, this is only in the last 15 years, did nothing to protect us. There was a solution that they implemented, the city of Brockton, to put into effect to minimize the poisonous gas that was being created in the landfill that the city of Brockton collected millions of dollars for. But that pre-treatment effect, when you keep talking about the science, cost money. To the tune of millions of dollars a year, they chose not to spend the money, but to pollute the residents of this town for over a decade. So when you want to sit there and tell, talk to me about science, talk to the children of this school and their children. And you get these little kids, and you say what you're saying to them about what should happen is if you're ever talking about experimenting at a small, instead of a $35 million scale, do it on a $1 million scale where you can pilot something that you want to put into effect and you show the evidence for 10 years that this new technology works. Because if they had done that in the city of Rockton when they experimented on us over here with the gypsum, they created that hydrogen sulfide factory? Because you can't tell me. I was here when a woman stood up and talked about her husband falling down in his house and his, her daughter dry heaving when she got home from school after a half an hour because of the effects of the gas that was coming out of it. So I saw all that, and you want to talk to me about incineration or anything, any other technology, prove it to me. You talked about modeling and plumes. That's exactly what they told us all in this meeting. Sat there and told us none of us would be affected by that. And they were all, all the experts were wrong. Yes, my name is Jenna Jackson. I live down on Pine Street. And I wanted to make two points first. The first one is Michelle has said the uh, Environmental Justice Act has been passed in July. And that's interesting because there are four criteria to meet environmental justice. All you need is one to fight something you don't want. Why four has all four of them? So we have a good chance if we don't want it, we don't get it. And the other thing I'd like to bring is uh, people brought up the um, power plant. It was 25 years ago that this, they started wanting to, to build a power plant. And they have tried and tried to get an air permit, and they have 20 something odd appeals for it. And we recently heard from our attorneys that they have finally put in a petition to have this case ended once and for all. It's been 25 years. The land has been sold. He has no place to put a power plant if he gets it. So that's good news for us. And I thought I'd like to share that with you. And the question I would like to ask these gentlemen is do you have to go to the DEP or the EPA to it, any of this to tell us what the air quality is going to be or what we're breathing? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, there's no, you haven't given us any of that that I can figure out. Well, we are still very early in the process, so that's why this meeting is actually fantastic to hear this feedback because we want to make sure we do our due diligence because we don't want to rush into any technology that is unproven, like, like has been described, 
Um, we want to make sure that we understand and vet everything and anything being considered. Um, and then once once we have more information to go to DEP or EPA with, then we'll have those meetings. So absolutely, yeah. Hey, Owen. Sean Hayward from Gerald and Drive. Uh, I just had a question. With any of these new technologies, I'm assuming that there's going to be some form of exhaust involved in all of them. And if so, are they going to solely rely on plume height, or is anything that passed through an air scrubber? And if it's solely relying on plume height, how large does the fan wing have to be to make it to be uh, required at the atmospheric elevation visible? So there's there's no technology that 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 I'm I'm aware of or that we're considering for this project that would just rely on plume height. Um, anything that would require any type of exhaust into the air um, would require scrubbers um, or other enhanced types of treatment. What was the cost of the last plant running? A year, 1.4, 1.5, what would it take a year? The last uh, burning plant, incinerator. The incinerator? Yeah. I think when we shut the incinerator down, the cost, the annual cost was about a million dollars. Okay. Now, the price of gas went up, right? Natural gas? It was ran off gas? It did. Okay. So our natural gas costs went up. The new plant, not like I was putting it through my head about doing it, but the new plant would be, we'd have a drying plant, which is going to be natural gas powered, so there's another section that's going to be pulling more gas on top of getting up to 17, 1800 degrees, so we're going to do with the new plant that's going to be full bore gas all the time. It's not just going to naturally heat itself. So it's, so it's a great question. Yeah. And, and I think Eric will explain the technology and how that works. Okay. So, um, some of the technologies being looked at, if, if, if we were to move forward, um, or if drying alone were to um, look like it had a lot of advantages, a dryer alone would require a natural gas source. Um, that dryer would be a, about the temperature of a traditional oven at your house, between 300 and 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, one of the reasons that, actually, one of the main reasons pyrolysis came into the equation is um, pyrolysis is able to generate enough heat just off of the sludge alone, because sludge does have a BTU value, um, that it would actually supply most of the heat source to the dryer so that you wouldn't need to feed it um, natural gas. So, and, and there's other technologies like that, like up in Andover, um, you know, they have digesters where they reduce the volume of their sludge and then they create methane off those digesters that they burn in uh, engines, and those engines produce heat for other processes. So. Um, to name two technologies. And the air scrubbers that supposedly they install all the time or replace all the time, they cost it, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot of different air treatment technologies, scrubbers being one of them. Um, they, um, it, it honestly depends on what we're treating, um, but yeah, they can vary in size and cost and in, in, in operation, some rely on a bacteria to, to consume the hydrogen and the sulfide. Some rely on uh, just water. Um, so, so there's a, a large variety of different types of air treatment processes. Particulates are so small that you can't see them, so they need something good to catch them, and then eventually, Absolutely. okay, let's cut corners, and poke a few holes here, or just not replace them. It's usually the end. It's, it comes down to low bid. I work for the MBTA, everything's low bid, and it's starting to regret it. Well, I, I agree. I mean, lo low bid is, is a dangerous thing in Massachusetts. It's great because it, it protects the it protects our dollars, um, but that's our job as, as the engineers to make sure that anything that gets bid meets every single requirement to, so that, yeah, all those particulates are being caught and that nothing, um, you know, those low bids are still, you're still getting the Cadillac and you're not getting the, you know, the junker. Just to address the low bid issue, actually, here in Brockton, many, many years ago, uh, the, in 30 years ago or more, there was a special home rule petition that was passed in the legislature. So Brockton operates under a special act 
And so it, there are rules for procurement for the wastewater treatment plant to give the city more leeway uh, in choosing quality and setting criteria so that they don't have to go with the low bid. Okay, I apologize. At this time, I want to thank Councilor at Large David Texera, who was here for a bit. And also, I was asked to ask um, our science experts what happens to PFAS when you, when you heat it? Um, so, I'll give you the short version in case anyone wants to stay all night. But, um, um, so, for that, that what I was talking about before, the difference between transformation and destruction. Um, in many cases, you transform PFAS to other things that are still just as harmful. Um, that's why it's important to make sure that we break that carbon fluorine bond so that we know definitively that the PFAS molecule is broken. Um, there are certain requirements to that we've observed to achieve that, both temperature, but also pressure, um, residence time, um, a lot of other factors go into it, so it's not just specifically temperature. Um, because there are some good studies on it, but um, but like the gentleman here said, um, they need to be piloted, they need to be proven. It can't just be a theoretical paper. Um, and fortunately, there are some good pilots that have been done and have been done, so, so we're aware of some of these processes that, that have achieved full destruction. Thank you, Eric. Who else has a question? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the scientist. Can you please tell me what, it, right, is that <coughs> Yes, you, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Um, could you tell me what the potential air has its out? That's my first question. And to piggyback on that, what I would like to know is, um, back in 2016, DuPont had a, a problem. PFAS went into the drinking water. And Six million Americans were poisoned. What's the potential of that PFAS coming into our uh, water? I mean, physics 101, right? Whatever goes up has to come down. Is it going to come down into our drinking water supply? So, I can't speak to the first question. Just, I'm not a medical doctor. I, I don't quite know the toxicology on, on a lot of these compounds and how they, how they affect people. Um, but fortunately, we have, and, and the state and federal government does have toxicologists that, that help define some of these limits that, that we have to meet. Um, and that would be part of the process and looking at different technologies. Um, the second question of PFAS. Um, so, so PFAS is, is so ubiquitous in our environment right now. It's it's in every one of this room's blood. It can be found. It's it's being measured down to levels that compounds have never been measured before, down to parts per trillion. Um, for perspective, that's one drop in I think like a dozen Olympic-sized swimming pools. So it's these are tremendously low concentrations that are, are can now be found in all our blood, um, and that's just because of the way we live. We have Gore-Tex jackets. We have non-stick frying pans. We have we have scotch guard in our carpets. Um, they're things that a lot of us don't want to give up because we like it. So it's all about responsible use of these things. So we, we study the fake transport of these compounds throughout a typical wastewater treatment process um, and, and many treatment plants throughout the country. And these compounds do transform through the process. There's no process at the wastewater treatment plant that destroys it um, until you get to um, some of these uh, Processes that have the ability to, uh, to concentrate it. Because it is such a hard compound to destroy, it needs to be concentrated and either destroyed by, by very strong electrical charge or very high temperatures or different variations of temperature, pressure, and uh, resonance time. So, so I'm sorry, it's, it's a long, complicated answer, but hopefully yeah, that it takes you so long in the show that it should really take you to test anything and then our water could potentially become contaminated. Well, so like the, like those six million Americans that drank the contaminated water. Well, well since then, a um, responsible company no less like DuPont. Just saying. Uh, there's a lot of lawsuits right now for DuPont. Uh, 
Um, but so, so Massachusetts DEP um, is actually at, on the forefront right now of PFAS, and we're one of the first states in the nation to have drinking water limits on PFAS. So, so every town, every city in the state has a PFAS limit on its drinking water. It's the sum of six of the most well-known compounds at 20 parts per trillion, um, which is well below the health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion that the federal government set. So, so I'm proud to be in Massachusetts for that reason, because um, we shouldn't be drinking this stuff. Can I just ask a question when you say popular Is that, when you say popular Yes. Pick in the end, right? Oh, yeah. Is that based on adult drinking it and not my two-year-old grandson? So um, parts per trillion or um, parts per million, that, that's, a, that's a concentration. Mm -hmm. So that's like. Um, I, I understand what concentration Okay. So those concentrations are usually developed based on um, maximum contaminant levels, and those are based on um, uh, vulnerable populations, so things like children. So for, for you and me, our, our maximum concentration that we can consume is probably a lot higher than that, right. um, but at 20 parts per trillion, and, and this isn't my specialty, but, but I believe uh, that concentration is based on vulnerable con vulnerable populations, which would be like children and things like that. Thank you. Our eyes are glazing over. We're, our meeting is coming to an end soon. But before we do end it, I would like to introduce State Senator Mike Brady, who schlepped all the way down from Boston to be with us. Thank you, Mr. Um, I just apologize. I had another meeting I was attending today on the other side of town. But um, we did do the budget in the Senate, and the House did the budget, and it was more local aid coming to the city of Brockton than the history of the Commonwealth, which is good news. Besides the Student Opportunity Act, which we all work together on the state delegation to get different form aid to our schools, local aid has increased substantially. And we also are putting money away for next year because I know everybody in the private sector is suffering with gas prices and everything else going through the roof, so we had to put money away to prepare because. The economy is at a nervous state right now. We are bringing more local aid into the city of Blackfoot as well as the other towns we represent. So I, uh, I just want to thank everyone for showing up. And um, if most of you know me and have my number, but if anyone wants my number before that, you leave tonight. I'll to give a call. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a comment? Okay, well, we're going to have to end it there. My name is oops, my name is Ronald Cobb. I live in Skyview Village, the adult community behind Kmart, and we are long term sewage. Uh, my question is why are we here tonight? And the question is directed at the Chief Financial Officer. Last time <clears throat> we, we went through an issue like this is when we brought the needed a second water so source and uh, we laid it up with the desalinization plant. Uh, which to me was a wrong decision, but that was mandated by the state. Why are we going through this now? What is forcing this? I look at it, it's either the cost of trucking, we know it's going to go through the roof, so that's a cost reason for you know looking into this. Or is the state, or is the equipment becoming obsolete, or is it, are we just chasing the $35 million dollars you know, that's up for grabs, and you know, we, we want to grab it. What's driving us into doing something? I, I would say it's a little of all of those, actually. Uh, so we are driven by our desire to contain the costs. As Pat mentioned at, at the beginning, our budget right now for the disposal of sludge is about $2 million a year, and that's escalating every year. So if there are technologies that are environmentally responsible and can save us money, then we'd like to look at them. And so that's the process that we're in now. Um, it, 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 and our sense of urgency is increased by the availability of the federal money. Now let me be clear, that does not mean, uh, and I know I speak on behalf of the mayor when I say this, that we will rush into any technology simply to save money. The mayor's made it very clear that public health is paramount. Uh, but we're here looking at this now and having this discussion with all of you 
because we're at the same time we're trying to be responsible with public health we're also trying to be responsible with public dollars and so really it's the convergence of those two things that's driving what we're doing that sounds good to me a uh, quick, quick, quick question uh, troy um, what other cities and municipalities in the state of Massachusetts, other than New Bedford, are considering the same proposal now? Uh, that I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, to the environmental experts. Um, so, a lot of cities right now, um, I mean, I guess a lot. Um, it's, it's actually it's quite astounding right now because of the, the rate of increase in disposal costs. Um, there are a, a lot and a lot of communities reaching out to, um, to the engineering community to look at long-term sustainable options for them. Um, yeah, to name a few, um, you know, Worcester, Springfield, uh, New Bedford recently, uh, Taunton, is, is, um, uh, Yarmouth, uh, Falmouth, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I could think about it more, a lot more, but, but yeah, there's a lot of communities looking at their long-term options right now. Oh, and do you know how, uh, how have those communities received this proposal? Um, well, well I, I can't speak for every community, but generally whenever um, any engineer would approach a, a community or, or work with a community on a project like this, it needs to be custom for that community because every community has their own needs, their own priorities. Um, some are industrial and just finances the important part. Some have communities like this that are very involved, um, and you know EJ communities has a really environmental justice community has a big impact. Um, so so it's it's always unique. Solid waste, but but sludge. I believe Lynn still incinerates. So Lynn still incinerates. And up and um, upper Blackstone in Worcester. Yeah. So we're not we're not Lynn. We're not like so. So when the response is, a lot of communities are considering their future. How are they going to deal with the sludge and the cake? Yeah, we are too. Brockton is too. We're right in line with all of our other communities. But how many other communities are saying, let's grab on to paralysis where it isn't anywhere? Which gasification in my book and high heat not and I'll tell you this has to go to the state and we don't want it right we don't want it we're making it clear we don't want it the mayor doesn't want it we don't want it I don't even really want to discuss it anymore but I know we have to I'm gonna you know we have suggestion. to yeah I put the cheap suggestion we have a whole spur behind my house that's all grown up with trees that leads right towards the well that could small extension to go right towards the uh, water plant and we can ship it out on train it would cut the cost of trucking i know that people talked about sh so this is the thing when we closed that incinerator some five years ago which was like the best day for ward four in decades um there were multiple options and one of the options at the beginning they talked about using train rails to get rid of the waste there, that is still an option why the option to Connecticut was chosen. That wasn't a real big dialogue with the community. And I appreciate Councilor Nicastro making sure that now we're going to be part of the conversation and maybe we can look at trains, maybe we can look at hooking into the MWRA. I mean, these are all options that are better than the 1950s version of incineration in 2021, 2022. I would just add a lot of these, most of these communities. Um, while incineration is probably a, a bad word, four-letter word for all of them, um, they probably all are considering things like drying and pyrolysis among a multitude of other technologies. Um, it's just the status of where we are with PFAS and sludge disposal. Um, it's, we want to look at everything and narrow down. So pyrolysis has been used in solid waste. Um, no, in this, in, like, why, why did someone tell me that this is only happening in Redwood City, California? You guys went out for a tour back in January to look at that plant. 
So there is a, there's one manufacturer that we went to visit um, in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, we went to visit them because they have the most data on PFAS and emissions out of all of the pyrolysis uh, providers and manufacturers. So they were the only ones that were able to show us that PFAS balance and that, that destruction of that, that CF bond. Um, that's, that's why we went, because it was the only one that actually showed promise that we thought deserved a look. So I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, as far as wastewater sludge, there is that one in, in Silicon Valley, California. Um, I know that company has like 12, 35 other installations throughout the world, but, but they are pyrolysis being used for solid waste and a lot of other installations. I just, I don't know where. Oh, no, they are. I'm not, I'm not saying pyrolysis is the direction we're going, it's just an option. But, um, but it is being used in the United States. That's, that's the only reason we're looking at it. To everyone's point, we, would have, we wouldn't be looking at technologies not used elsewhere, because we don't want to be a test case. What else, what other technologies other than the consideration are you considering? So there's, there's different types of dryers, like the ones Deer Island has. Um, there's, uh, just to name a few, belt dryers, paddle dryers, uh, rotary drum dryers, all create different quality products at the end. Um, that have different end uses. There's several different pyrolysis manufacturers that, that have different um, techniques to pyrolyze. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time on gasification, but, but we have an understanding enough to know that we don't want it here. Um, incineration, there's a couple different technologies, multiple hearth, fluidized bed, but we know those are not on the table here. Um, there's even uh, more advanced processes um, that are, are more bench scale, so we're not getting a lot of attention, but electrolysis type of technologies that have worked at the smaller scale but never at the scale of Rockton, so they're not getting that amount of attention. Um, and then there's always the do-nothing option. There's continue with the status quo and, and ship to Naugatuck with the reality that that might go away and we might have to ship it to another another state, another, I mean, right now in New Hampshire and Vermont, they're sending it to Canada. So, um, so that is the benchmark that we're comparing against, is, is the, the status quo. I want to thank these experts for joining us this evening. And I want to thank all of you, Ward 4 and Beyond residents. You've been great. This was a lot of information. You can see this is an issue that's not going away, and we've got to be part of the, the decision-making and the solutions. I also especially want to thank Patrick Sullivan, our DPW commissioner. He just spent his birthday evening with us. Happy birthday. Patrick Hill, please forgive me. Patrick Hill, happy birthday. Thank you all of you for being here. Good night.